Hi, Emma. How's everyone? We're going to go live soon with Ryan Richardson, Miss Black America. Hello. I'm excited too. Can you hear me okay, Emma? Hopefully. Hi. Fantastic. Okay. Hopefully Ryan will be dealing dialing in shortly. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Emma. Hello, everyone who's joining. Thank you for being here. Michelle, I'm excited too, girly. This is wonderful. Genevieve, hello. Oh, that's so sweet of you to dial in. Oh, I miss you. You've been burning up LinkedIn with all this good information on marketing and being your best self. That's Genevieve Paturo from the Pajama Program. She's the founder of the Pajama Program. Genevieve has been a very wonderful dear friend and mentor to the Fibroid Foundation and uh, her advice has helped us to really grow and blossom and I'm very grateful for that. She's in New York City. So if you're in the nonprofit arena or looking for great business advice in general, follow Genevieve Paturo on LinkedIn and uh, she will guide you in the right direction. Hold on, everyone. We'll be starting soon. I hope everyone's having a good evening. Um, it's been a long day, but all day long I was excited about High Serenity. I was excited about this talk tonight. I think it's going to be very informative and um, Ryan's amazing. Um, there she is. There she is. She's logging on now. It's connecting. I feel like I'm a stage announcer. Five, four, three, two, one. Hi, Juliet. Awesome, Juliet from the Bay Area. She's just precious, absolutely adorable. Ryan's connecting, so just bear with us and then we'll be into uh, our conversation.
I hope that everyone's doing well and being safe and um, taking good care of themselves, taking good precautions and still trying to have ways, find ways to have fun. It says connected, but I don't see her yet. Ryan's trying to connect. I don't know what happened. Hold on. Let me try this again. Add her again to see. Okay, we're connected. There she is. Miss Ryan. Hey. Hey, I can't see you yet, lady. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is weird. I can't see. Oh, wait. Did I do something weird to my phone? Oh, I did. I didn't realize I could even. Okay, there, there I am. There she is. <laughs> Hey, lady. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I am well. I am well. It's good to see you. Likewise. We've been talking so much and we rarely get to connect face to face. So that's I always know. really nice. And uh, I know. thank you for joining us this evening and for speaking with our community. People are so excited. I just cannot even tell you. <laughs> Well, thank um, you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, we, um, we're just really honored. And um, the first time I read about your story, I just was so grateful. Whenever a woman shares her story, particularly when she has a platform that's broader, um, it's just, it's really meaningful. And it, um, oh. it helps to bring uh, a lot of much needed attention to something that a lot of us are facing. So I'm so happy to, to see you today. Um, oh, thank you. Thank how you. was your day? Let's start with that. Um, I feel like this is like the middle of it. I am like nowhere near this day. I'm going to join you for this call, which is like my break. And then I'm jumping back into work for the next several hours. Okay. Uh, I have a bunch of projects that are uh, all taking off at the same time. So it means okay. I'm juggling a million things at once and seemingly trying to stuff two or three days worth of work into any given single day. I understand completely. And that was going to be my last question. So mm. think about if you can share what you'd like to share, because we would like to know what else you're going to be working on because you're a powerhouse. Yeah. And um, so I'll jump in so that you okay. can get to your projects because I get that. <laughs> Um, every day you for me is for like roller hour. skate. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so you are Miss Black America and mm -hmm. that just blows my mind. And, um, <laughs> me too does, sometimes. does it, yeah, I, yeah. I can imagine it might. Yeah. But you carry it so beautifully and, uh, it's such an achievement and it's the 50th anniversary on top of that. Yeah. I mean, that's just amazing to me. Can you share some of the background on your road to such an amazing accomplishment? Yeah, yeah. I'll talk about kind of my background. And then I also think Miss Black America's background okay. is really important. The, the, the story separate from me. And I, maybe I'll start there. So Miss Black America was founded, uh, or the organization was founded in 1968. Uh, and for kind of greater context, uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even the 70s, mm -hmm. um, pageants, however you feel about them now, love them, hate them, indifferent towards them all together, mm -hmm. uh, pageants were America's pastime for women, effectively, right? Absolutely. And the two largest pageants in America were Miss America, which had been around since 1921, and Miss USA, um, which at that point had been around for probably close to 20 years uh, itself. And neither had ever had not only a, a Black winner, but neither had had a Black contestant at the national level in 1968. And in fact, for many years leading up to that, Miss America, um, kind of the standard bearer for pageantry, had an explicit rule that said uh, that contestants needed to be white and of good moral character in the Christian faith, right? Uh, so the founder of Miss Black America pageant, a guy named J. Morris Anderson from Philadelphia, you know, he had two little black girls and he asked them one day what they wanted to be when they grew up. Uh, and they said Miss America, and he knew at least at that point that was not 
possible for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, thinking about all the other stuff that was happening in context in 1968, this is, you know, the year that uh, Dr. King was assassinated, the year that Bobby, King, uh, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, the year that the country was facing such a kind of upheaval uh, in, in a public discourse around race and culture and who is American, who gets to represent America, not dissimilar, frankly, from the one that we're having today, um, that in that context, a Miss Black America pageant, you know, a, a sport, you know, America's pastime mm -hmm. for women, but with Black women in it, um, was really, really significant. And the first pageant was staged uh, in competition, excuse me, <clears throat> with the Miss America pageant mm -hmm. uh, in Atlantic City as well. Uh, and the pageant generations as uh, this pop culture phenomenon for black people and on network TV uh, kind of running frankly opposite in competition with the Miss America pageant. We that can't hear you bad. quite as well right now. I'm sorry? Okay, now I can hear you better. Oh. It Okay. Uh, it ran in competition with the Miss America pageant uh, on television uh, and ended up being a, a breeding ground or at least a, a jumping off point for the careers of so many of the folks that we consider um, icons culturally in our communities, right? You know, the Jackson 5 had their first ever live or national TV uh, performance on the Miss, Miss Black America stage I had no idea. Uh, in the early 70s. Um, you know, we had one contestant uh, that everyone knows, she's a Miss Tennessee 1971, went on to become this world famous woman named Oprah Winfrey. Uh, but Tony Braxton and so many other women have come through the program over the years. Uh, and it really did shape not just uh, the landscape of the pageant world in, in such that it ensured that black women would be able to compete in all major pageants by forcing the hands of Miss America and Miss USA, but it shaped kind of the cultural conversation around black women as it pertained to their value um, as women, as the ideal woman, as beautiful, as talented, as, as witty and charming uh, and valuable. Uh, mm -hmm. members of an American community. So there's a great legacy behind Miss Black America. Uh, and I tell that story because that legacy is so important uh, in my story of why I came mm -hmm. to compete for Miss Black America. So um, I started competing, gosh, I guess my first pageant was late in my teen years. I was still in high school. Mm -hmm. I did it on a dare. I didn't know why I was Would doing you? it. Like I was a competitive athlete. I rolled off of a football field, quite literally, and walked mm -hmm. onto a pageant stage and was awful at it. Um, but I kind of caught the bug and it became my new sport. And by the time I was going off to college, I needed to be able to pay for my private university education. Uh, and at that point, the Miss America pageant, you know, regarded itself as the largest provider of scholarship assistance to women in the world of any okay. organization. Um, really? Which, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's something, you know. Good, <laughs> good, bad, or indifferent, however you feel about that statement, that was actually the truth. They were the largest provider of scholarship assistance to women exclusively in the world. Uh, so I competed for Miss America uh, to pay for my college education and uh, won a lot of scholarship money over a number of years competing in Miss America, funded the bulk of my undergraduate education uh, through scholarships from pageants. Uh, like I said, caught a bug. It became my sport. I was good at it and I enjoyed it so wow. I just kept doing it uh, and kind of parallel process building my career and reached an inflection point where uh, I, something had to give I felt and I, I figured it was time to retire from pageants and I wasn't really uh, focused on that part of my life and that hobby any longer but a girlfriend of mine who was Miss Black America the year before I was crowned uh, called me and said like hey FYI it's uh you know, I'm giving up, giving up my crown, and it's the 50th anniversary of the pageant, and I think you should compete. And I was like, yeah, no, absolutely not, girl. Really? Uh, not you told her no? Yeah, I wasn't thinking oh about pageants. Goodness. I was just not concerned about competing in a pageant. Um, but she reminded me of the history, right, of the mm -hmm. story that I just told you and of the legacy of Miss Black America. And, frankly, twisted my arm and peer pressured me into it by saying, uh, you know, I know all that you gained from competing in pageants. I know that you paid for college through pageants. I know that you built uh, so many of the skills that you leveraged for your Incredible. career through pageants. Uh, I know you through pageants. You built your network and your friendships through this. Uh, and you, as a black woman, Ryan, would not have had all of that uh, benefit that was afforded to you if it were not for the 1968 founding of the Miss Black America pageant.
That so is I really get, absolutely I incredible. I really believe that there are so many serendipitous moments in life. Yeah. That absolutely. really catapult you. If you're well intended, you know, it just that that type that energy just kind of finds you and mm -hmm. just, you know, um ushers you in the right direction. I know I feel that in my life. And I did not know that history. I I mean, I think it's so um it's so poignant, particularly now, because, and I think as a little girl about wanting to stay up to watch the pageant. And yeah. we look at what it is on the surface, but we don't know that rich history and the exposure that it can provide. And uh, that's really fascinating because things is. are not it always is, what right? you seem. That and you so think. Terry, actually, give me one second. For some reason, sure. my audio just dropped out so I can hear you but not as clearly as i want to so is this better is it me hmm, let's me see who speak up figure out who it is <laughs> which one of us is i can it? hear you perfectly it's you can hear me perfectly all yeah. right that's strange give me hmm. we might have to do something unpleasant which might be me hitting this x and then immediately re-requesting but i want to hear your question clearly okay okay all right uh, okay okay folks so ryan dropped off and she's gonna dial back in and um, I hope that you're enjoying the conversation so far. It's fascinating. I've learned a lot already. Um, feel free to tag your friends and um, invite them to the conversation. Um, because this is really, we're learning lots of information about the history of pageantry and, and, Ryan, and how it's touched Ryan's life. It says connecting. So we should see her shortly. I think that's Gracia from Ghana. Is that you, Gracia? I think. And thank you all. It's good to see all of the notes. Emma, I had no idea of that history either. Hi, Genevieve. She is wonderful, isn't she? Oh, okay. Gracia, where are you? Sorry, I had that wrong. Oh, New York. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome, welcome. Okay, it dropped off, so we're going to try this again because it didn't connect. Okay, now we're going to do this again. Okay. Technology. It says connecting again. So. Here we Thank go. You. Can it you hear me okay now? Fine. Yes, okay. I can. And it works just fine when you're requesting me. There's something so weird about me trying to do it. Uh, and I can see it loading and it's like, nope, we're not letting you on. That's okay. Emma, our social media manager, made sure that I uh, tested everything this um, t earlier today. Because believe it or not, this is my first IG Live. Is it? Yes, ma'am. Well, look at this. I get to join you for your first IG Live. All right. I, I, yeah. feel, I feel honored. Even <laughs> you'll be honored We're now. honored. Yeah. yeah. So, Someone um, said Mer uh, Mercury retrograde. Yeah. IG, I, IG or the solar system just doesn't want us to be great right now. Yeah. But that <laughs> while you were reconnecting, the comments went through. People were blown away with your, um, your story. They didn't know about oh. the history. And, uh, and so I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Um, so what Miss Black America is just one of the hats you wear because you're very busy, right? <laughs> I know this in lots of amazing things. And you have a social action campaign called the Take Up Space Movement. Yeah. Um, first of all, I love that name. I know that you referenced taking up space in your TED Talk. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that movement? Sure. Uh, so the impetus for the movement, the idea of it effectively um, came out of uh, a, a talk that I was giving last year. So I spent the bulk of 2019 out on tour, uh, on a speaking tour of the U.S. Okay. Before I was Miss Black America, I, I had like a career, I was somebody. Um, and I had spent a, a decade in consumer tech, uh, working in big tech. I worked at Uber, worked at a couple of, of startups, uh, worked uh, in kind of launching new brands. Uh, at T-Mobile for a period. Uh, and I had this, frankly, decidedly negative experience uh, w 
when I got heavy into the tech space, um, because what I recognized was, at least in, in the big tech company that I was working for at the time, um, it, there was not an appetite to uh, include people who look like me, right? It was not a space where uh, the unique perspectives and lived experiences of women and people of color uh, were valued. And uh, if we were there, it was uh, to suck, you know, some value out of us, but definitely not to nurture us. Uh, and not I experienced us. that in construction management too. There you go. Uh, so, you yes. know, culture was not one that was, uh, yeah. That was uh, inclined mm -hmm. to foster yeah. the development and thriving of uh, underrepresented talent. You know, mm -hmm. they're a very kind of homogenous uh, bro culture. And if you fit it, you would thrive. And if you were anything other, um, you know, you would suffer. And one of the ways that I tried to cope with that in my career, uh, and I did this kind of unintentionally, was I started to shrink myself, right? I, like I had this great job that I loved and I was very proud of and I was proud of the work that I did but I hated going to work every day and the way that I decided that I would be able to survive that was by putting my head down just plugging through just doing the work uh, and uh, shrinking myself as to not offend the sensibilities of the predominant majority uh, within that culture yeah um, shrink yeah yeah and that mm -hmm. was uh, like a fundamentally flawed really problematic environment to to work in and to exist mm -hmm. in but my response to it did no service to me either and i one day i had this aha moment and i talk about this in uh, another one of my not the ted talk but another talk that's online um about you know taking up space uh this concept i recalled back to a conversation i had with my dad who you know i talked about how i walked off the football field mm -hmm. to uh the pageant stage my dad was a sports coach i was playing football and i remember as a kid uh you know uh on the football field i was doing this weird thing where i was scared to take a hit and he reminded mm -hmm. me that in my position my job was quite literally to take up space right to protect wow. the runner. uh and i remember having a conversation with him after work one day uh you know one of those dejecting like soul crushing kind of days yeah. at this company um and he said the same thing to me again. He reminded me, like, no, your job's to take up space. And I, I, my mind was blown because I thought that was always football coaching, when in actuality what that was was life was coaching. Life coaching, yeah. 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 So the out of that kind of realization and some of the talks that I'd been giving on tour last year about this very message for women and people of color in particular was born the Take Up Space movement, uh, a social action campaign that is designed to support the social, political, and economic, uh, or building in the social, political, and economic power of women and underrepresented people of color, most uh, particularly in those environments where we are extreme minorities, uh, we are underrepresented, we are long underserved. And we do that in a multitude of ways. The first is that we've built uh, an online platform and a community for Right now, it's largely women, but women and people of color to share uh, their stories of how they learn to take up space, you know, uh, at work, you know, in their offices, take mm -hmm. up space in their communities, uh, take up space in their homes and in their families. Because oftentimes we, we learn this behavior of shrinking ourselves, uh, frankly, at home mm -hmm. uh, and share those narratives uh, as a, a means of emboldening other women. And then the next step is to build further educational resources, public and private partnerships with uh, brands and nonprofits to support uh, the work of the Take Up Space movement in corporate settings, right? To affirm that certain mm -hmm. organizations that partner with us are safe spaces for mm -hmm. uh, people of color and women and underrepresented minorities to actually take up space as their whole selves. Uh, and then we also have a branded merchandise line, and I totally failed uh, to plug this. <laughs> well, we will plug it too. for you later. Yeah. Emma, did you get that? Emma's watching. We'll plug it for you later. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it could have been where my ticket uh, space movement swag, uh, but also built a, a merch store because what we thought was, um, you know, this message is a rallying cry in many ways. I wanted to be able to create pieces that were wearable protest signs because mm -hmm. this uh, act of taking up space boldly and intentionally and deliberately uh, in those spaces uh, where folks would much prefer we shrink and stay out of the exactly. way and not disturb their peace. Um, that's an act of protest. So wear that yeah. protest on your body. So uh, we've got a whole store uh, and have actually new stuff coming to the take up space. I uh, will be getting uh, something. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we really need that. I mean, I'm thinking back in my career and I wish I had had that advice. 
Oh. Um, because it would have helped me so much because I did shrink. And mm -hmm. it was like a joke within our company. You know, there were like 30,000 employees worldwide and there were like 10, you know, people, African-American uh, people working for the organization in the city I was in. And it mm -hmm. was like a joke because we call one guy the poster child because they had him kind of appear for everything. And, <laughs> You know, and it, literally, you know, and, and no yeah. one was really getting promoted to any position of stature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were all these requirements to be able to be promoted if you had brown skin. But if you didn't, you just go up and up and up if you weren't drinking with the boys. And it was yeah. just, you know, um, I, I think that that conversation of taking up space is also very relevant now because yeah. um, there is... Um, I think that as people of color, we have adjusted to um, existing in an environment that is not inherently familiar to us. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I know in my own life, as I've become more comfortable with taking up space, um, I've been happier. I've mm -hmm. been able to express my true self. And um, it just uh, is life is just much more pleasant so Isn't it right? I, <laughs> I encourage you yeah. to keep pushing that message and we will support you because i love that i think it's it's fantastic i think emma just posted um the link for you yeah um, um i think people thank people you emma. actually mm -hmm. go ahead did i lose you no go ahead yeah. oh we lost her again no. Okay, hold on, folks. Hi, Tiana. We lost her one more time. We're going to try this one more time. Okay. Okay. We're connecting. Let's see if we can make this happen. This is so weird. All right. Yeah, I know. It's, so, it's like, so funny. It's okay <laughs> though. We were we were burning up the airwaves. That's what it was. It was too much fun. Just had to, you know, go off temporarily. <laughs> so I will um go on to our next question, which is your amazing TED talk, Beauty is Power. So I love that. And I know you mentioned take up space in that. Um, and you talked about proudly owning your own beauty and I remember, I think I shared this with you in my career, um, I would shrink. Like if I had to <laughs> speak in front of a room, I was very nervous about people looking at me and what I had on and God forbid, because I'm busty, having yeah. a blouse on with a button. So I kind of tried to avoid that at all costs. Mm -hmm. And um you know, and I work because of the construction arena in predominantly male environments. Yep. And um, it just is, I thought you touched on so many very important um, issues and you drew a conclusion so beautifully. Um, and I just wondered what, how you came to that story and that TED talk and were there specific moments or thoughts that kind of made that um, gel in the way that you so beautifully presented it? I just thought it was so many people and everyone listening, if you have not heard Ryan's TED Talk, Beauty is Power, look at it as soon as this is over, not now, but as soon as this is over. So what, what, was, what were some of the catalysts for that talk? Right. Yeah, there were a and, lot of things. And, yeah, there were there were a lot. And thank you for for watching it and for sharing it with everyone. Um, it was uh, writing it in, it in and of itself was a labor of love. Getting to the point uh, where I was even prepared to put those thoughts on paper and share them was uh, a, a, an effort that was a product of like years of kind of lived experience. Right, I, I talked about how pageants became my sport and I loved them and I was really good at it. So I kept competing, uh, but I was also building a career. And there was a period in which I retired from pageants and put it to the side. And that was in large part because I, 
you know, had been intentional as I was building my career to also build this brick wall, this great wall of China between the hobby and my career, because I was very well aware that there was conventional wisdom that existed around um, beauty and women in, in particular who invest in beauty or leverage beauty. Uh, and that was that they do so because they lack, you know, intellectual capacity, right? You, you leverage, you, you lean on your looks because you don't have anything better, right? That's that's the thinking. Um, and as I was building my career in tech, uh, I worked very hard to develop credibility, uh, to demonstrate my competence, to earn the trust and buy-in of my colleagues, uh, of, um, you know, clients, of partners. And I could not risk anything undermining all of my hard work. Right, couldn't risk anything undermining mm -hmm. um, the success that I had earned. Uh, and by the time uh, that I, you know, came around and decided to compete for Miss Black America, uh, I had made incredible strides, objectively speaking, in my career. I was 27 years old, and I was a vice president of a hundred million dollar technology wow. team. I had been named one of the most influential Black executives in corporate America. Um, I had busted my butt. Right. Yeah, did. Yeah, right. yeah. And I had this great deep seated fear um, that developed just as a woman who paid attention, right, and understood the way in which that we stereotype beautiful women or women who invest in their beauty or the woman who's too pretty as not being serious or intelligent or competent. Uh, and I was sensitive to that and terrified that I'd fall victim to it. Uh, and then after I competed for Miss Black America, uh, I, you know, because it was important to me, because of the historical precedent that we talked about, and because of all the ways that I, I personally benefited from the legacy of the organization, even before competing in it, um, I knew I couldn't keep that a secret. That was not going to be possible. My cover was blown, right? Uh, like a, a Google alert was was going to preclude me from ever being able to keep, uh, you know, the wall between those two worlds anymore. And mm -hmm. I remember I was, uh, you know, one particular situation uh, happened not long after I won Miss Black America. I had already been thinking about moving to kind of my next role professionally, and I didn't mm -hmm. know what that was going to be, but I had been having conversations with um, a handful, meetings with a handful of executive search recruiters, because like I said, I was in, a, in an executive role, but I was young in an executive mm -hmm. role, and for the next level of my career, I thought it was going to be really important um, to cement kind of that status that I had built for myself by going to the right company and being in the right high, highly visible, uh, highly influential role in that organization. And the way I was going to do that, you know, was through executive search recruiters who are filling these kind of roles that aren't getting posted to like the company's website or, um, you know, to LinkedIn. These are the most important mission critical roles in any organization. Mm -hmm. The one they have to find the absolute best talent in the world to fill. And I was sitting down for lunch with uh, this executive recruiter who runs a search firm here in New York. Uh, and he had a couple clients that I was chatting with and he was presenting me to, uh, but this was our first face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, and we were hitting it off and having a great conversation kind of about my career, about background, about um, my perspectives on the clients he was introducing me to in, in their roles. Uh, and then he goes, uh, so tell me about this pageant thing. I, like, I, I Googled you and stuff came up. And uh, he was confused. And I was almost like this deer in headlights for a second yeah. because I didn't know how I wanted to respond to that. Because I don't think I had come to terms with how I would articulate my uh, my dual reality, right, as this woman who had certainly invested. And because you weren't there to discuss that. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. you know, I, I guess you can argue that all's fair game, right? Uh, as, yeah. as in the internet age, all's fair game. If it's on the internet uh, and, any, and someone can find it out about me, uh, I can and should expect uh, to be asked about it. But in this capacity, um, you know, it was like all of my worst fears were literally sitting across the table at lunch. And I mm -hmm. didn't know how I was going to respond to that immediately or eloquently and, and, you know, massage that really elegant, mm -hmm. elegantly. Um, so I was just, I was honest and I, I kind of explained why, why I did it and the value I got from it. But I realized as I had this conversation with him and I felt like he was satisfied with the answer, but my response was just decidedly um, apologetic. You know, I, I walked away feeling like I, I was almost apologizing for having done something there. that I was actually proud of. 
that I had worked really hard uh, mm -hmm. to be accomplished in, just as I had worked really hard to be accomplished in my career, something that I should be celebrating uh, and really leaning into. But instead, I was kind of, again, shrinking myself, putting my head down, saying, mm -hmm. oh, don't, don't, don't worry about that part. That, that's not important. Worry about the serious me. Worry about the respectable me, the intellectual mm -hmm. me, uh, as if I, I wasn't both of those things, right? As if Ryan Richardson, mm -hmm. the intellectual, the professional, the competent uh, leader, was not also the woman who won Miss Black America. And it was that kind of aha moment that uh, told me, dictated to me, um, that I need to get my stuff together, right? I need to get my story together and I needed to yeah. own my narrative here because I needed to be able to more effectively and forcefully communicate um, why I did this, why there's no problem that I did this, why I'm proud uh, that I did this, and in turn be able to give cover to other women um, who may want to be, who may want to compete in pageants or wear makeup or wear that bright dress or wear that red lipstick or whatever it is that we say that women cannot do and also be intelligent and competent, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I was going to rail against that. I was going to continue to rail against it uh, at every opportunity that I that I got. So when I was writing the TED Talk, I, you know, I wanted to speak not just to my personal lived experience, and that's mm -hmm. in there. We've now heard some of that here, but speak uh, to why fundamentally uh, our attitudes about beauty uh, and power are flawed because from a sociological perspective, there is a wealth of evidence and research that supports that, uh, you know, beauty or aesthetic appeal appearance is directly linked to our understanding, our interpretation of an individual's persuasiveness. And persuasion happens to be one of the most powerful and sustainable vehicles for power that anyone can leverage. So uh, if persuasive power is the most sustainable there is, and beauty is a vehicle for persuasion, then in effect, beauty does yield power, and women shouldn't need to apologize for that or excuse themselves for leaning into it. And um, you brought up so many things. The first thing that really caught my attention is that the fears and concerns that come with success. Mm-hmm. Um, Th that's something that is, you know, you could have a whole conversation just on that alone because you're adjusting to a new normal. Um, you've redefined yourself perhaps. Mm -hmm. And um, there are other dynamics at play altogether. Mm -hmm. And so that's very, you know, I heard you, I hear you and um, I get that. And I think you leveraged it beautifully. Um, also too, I thought about the times in my career where I felt like I had to explain myself. Mm -hmm. That's always a red flag for me. Yeah. It's either a flag that I have, to, it's time to go <laughs> or time to make some changes because if people are coming, sorry, and that's my dog, um, <laughs> He's decided, to, he's decided to, to join the IG Live. Um, uh, you, you know, we should never be in a position where we have to explain ourselves and be yeah. on the defense. Yeah. Um, but you actually turned it into something beautiful and um, used that moment to learn something about yourself yeah. and to define how you wanted to walk in the world. And I think that is incredibly powerful because you're helping all of us. Um, you know, these insights that you give, you know, as you were giving the talk, I was walking back from like little girl to maturing mm -hmm. to first jobs to just experiences at work. And I think it's so powerful because it just lays out. Um, uh, it's a toolkit, really, for how to exist and how to grapple with the, the feelings that you have. Um, and um, it, it, I thought it was just outstanding. So thank you for doing that. I thought it was thank wonderful. You. you know what I wonder too, uh, as an aside, like I know you speak a lot, but did you practice that a lot? Because the delivery was just incredible. <laughs> you know what's actually funny? Um, so oftentimes when you're speaking, depending on the environment, there's normally something, uh, we'll call it, we call it a confidence monitor. Basically, it's, it's a monitor where you will literally, you write your script and you, you, or you write your speech, you know your speech, but you have 
there's a monitor somewhere, right? And if you're having a moment, right, you look mm -hmm. down, get yourself back on, on, on uh, your notes. Um, this TEDx did not have a confidence monitor. Wow. So, we, like, you know, this is TED Talks can be up to 18 minutes. Mine is about 16 and some change. Um, this is completely memorized. And I was at technically still finishing it, like, the night before. <laughs> um, so when, oh I, my God, when I actually right? came to talk, uh, what you see is the first time that other people had ever seen the whole talk. It was the first time I had done oh it. Oh my goodness. That was uh, completely from memory. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it, <laughs> it's not, it's really not common. I have not done too many speaking engagements where uh, I, I was not going to be able to reference notes at any point or an outline or, or, uh, my talks no way uh, and, you know you never read from it but it's nice to have handy in case yeah. you know i don't know a brick falls from the sky and distracts you and throws your your train of thought off um and that was not uh, a resource that i had available to me uh at that point so yeah it was completely off uh off of memory wow that that's incredible wow oh. i'm learning so much tonight <laughs> Well, as you know, um, it's Five Word Awareness Month, July, yes. all of July, and you courageously shared your story, which I'm so grateful for. And um, I just wondered what led you to share your story. I think I might know some of it because I see how you, you're just really um, unafraid to stand in your truth. Um, and I applaud you for that. But were, what made you decide to make that step and, and, and share your Five Word story? Yeah, I, I think in part, um, you know, becoming Miss Black America uh, did cause a certain mind shift for me in that um, I felt a responsibility to be um, as transparent as possible with uh, my community, my tribe, my audience, the largely women and uh, mostly women of color who follow me and, uh, you know, care about what I have to say for whatever reason and mm -hmm. uh, you know, glean some value from the insights that I was able to provide. And quite oftentimes, the things that I was talking about were rooted in career uh, and workplace dynamics and culture uh, and things, you know, that were these kind of hard-earned, battle-tested lessons learned for me over the, the years prior. Um, and I'm happy to share that. But I was also having kind of, you know, at the time that I was crowned Miss Black American for a couple months thereafter, um, this really serious health battle um, that challenged me in enormous ways. Uh, and I knew that I was not alone in that battle. I knew that, you know, statistically speaking, so many other women, mm -hmm. uh, especially Black women, were mm -hmm. facing something very similar to what I was facing. Uh, and that experience for me was awful. It was decidedly negative. And we can talk about like my crazy fibroid story. Uh, but I knew that if it, if it were happening to me, if I was having such a horror story um, with kind of like our American healthcare system as it supports black women uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, fibroids, then other black women were also having this mm -hmm. problem. And I, you know, was going to use that platform that I was committed to being transparent on um, to talk about this, to tell this story as well in hopes that it helps someone um, in a way that would have been beneficial to me at, at the onset of my story. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think, I'll, um, I think that, you know, I'd love to have a conversation later um, with you about just how we as women trudge through pain like and and how we should be thinking about that because mm -hmm. it it doesn't fall lightly on me that I started an organization based on decades of pain of personal pain and um i I feel that somehow we sometimes feel that we have to exist in that pain. You know, and I know um, one of the questions we had for you was, um, you know, did you, how did you deal with the challenges while you were competing? Yeah. And, and I'm sure that was not easy. I mean, I, you know, it's, um, you know, I think just like your TED Talk, there's a lot to unpack about um, how we exist in pain. 
yeah. and, and, and what our perceptions are around um, living through that yeah. dynamic. Um, yeah, and I, I think about it um, both kind of in the literal physical sense and it, frankly in an emotional sense. There is this kind of warped um, social dynamic or expectation that links a woman's value or particularly a black woman's value with her capacity to endure pain. I don't know if y'all caught that. You're right, yeah. You're right. Um, you know, and, and we see it manifested in a lot mm -hmm. of spaces. We see it manifested in the way in which uh, we are treated in healthcare environments. We also see it manifested uh, in the way in which we are engaged in, like, our relationships, right? Think about, like, our relationships with partners. You know, the, the, the good woman is the one that you put through hell, um, and she stays with you. And it's, mm -hmm. there's something about um, Black women uh, – that our culture has decided we are supposed to endure pain mm -hmm. and our value is rooted in our strength and capacity to shoulder that burden and keep on plugging along. Uh, and that's not right. And part of the reason why, uh, you know, to, to further uh, speak to the last question and answer, um, why it was so important for me to use that platform was I was in chronic pain for so long. And I had doctors who ignored that pain. Um, I had doctors who did not take that pain seriously, and I reached a boiling point, an inflection point where uh, my body could no longer uh, could no longer take it and could no longer hide. You know what the source mm -hmm. of that pain was. It became abundantly clear very quickly mm -hmm. um, why I was in such chronic pain for so long, um, and I did not want other women to feel as though they needed to shoulder the burden of that pain quietly for, uh, for as long as I did. Um, so when I was competing for Miss Black America, uh, you know, a couple months prior, I had got, gone to another new doctor, a new gynecologist, and was going through another new exam. And I remember mm -hmm. her um, kind of pushing on my abdomen, just doing her exam. And she, uh, she looks at me and she goes, relax relax your your abdomen i was like i am relaxed and the look of sheer horror that came yeah. over her face um was super telling and i remember laying kind of in her office on the table and seeing that look on her face and i immediately started crying because uh -huh. this look was not good um and it, it turns out that a fibroid that i i had known about years uh, prior and that a doctor had um, diagnosed, but I've always been sure, like, it's shrinking. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. You're just going to limit your, you know, excess hormone intake, stop eating meat, and you'll be fine, had grown to be about a, a four and a half, five pound tumor uh, in my uterus that had um, squashed my bladder, it had dislodged my IUD into my cervix, like nothing was where it was supposed to be inside of me anymore. Um, and my body had physically changed. And my doctor discovered this literally two months, mm -hmm. maybe three months before Miss Black America. And, you know, you go off to compete at this level. And I, I've always thought of like pageants, uh, you know, pageant as my sport, as a competitive athlete, I trained for pageants the way I did for football and soccer and every other sport, you know, track and field and every sport before that. Uh, and, you know, you train in a multitude of ways. You train your mind, you train on your talent, you train mm -hmm. your communication skill, you, you train your wit and your charm so you can impress these five to 10 uh, perfect strangers and judges, but you also train your body, right? And I, ha I was very proud over many years of my capacity to execute a really disciplined workout regimen, to, you know, live by a pretty rigid diet, you know, in the weeks and months leading up to a pageant, to be able to achieve the result that I needed as a competitive athlete on that pageant stage, right, to, to create, I, you know, I was able, I had this power that I was able to harness in my hands, right, to mm -hmm. make my body do, look like, be, exactly what I wanted it to be through my own sheer will and discipline. I knew I wow. could always do that. And then suddenly here was this thing, this foreign thing me, yeah. that I couldn't control that uh, impeded my ability to control my body the way that I always had. And I felt like I had lost control of everything. Uh, and that was really devastating because oh, yeah. it was totally new for me. Uh, and I remember it gone off to Miss Black America um, it was the least confident 
I had ever felt in my body in the heart. Really? Side. Yeah. The wow. hardest I ever worked on my body and the least confident. Because when you I mean, I'm a I'm a thin woman. I, I was you know, I'm five ten, but I was probably 125, 130 pounds. I'm small. Mm -hmm. I have a five pound tumor. It's like a, a not a soft like a softball. Effect. That's substantial. It's not larger. Yeah. Um, you know, and to the untrained eye, I'm I'm thinking judges are looking at me like, look at this chick with the great legs and the beer gut. Um, but in actuality, you know, I, I couldn't control this, uh, and that was really really hard for me to reconcile with. And it was a difficult time. Um, personally, you know, the, the response to that new doctor that mm -hmm. I found was also disappointing mm -hmm. and discouraging, and I think could have been quite tragic. Um, you know, for, for me as at that point, a 27 year old woman with no children who was being told that she was going to have to have a hysterectomy. Um, if I, you know, were not the type of person who always questions authority, right? You advocated for you. And advocates for myself and asks what my other options are and keeps pushing. And when someone tells me, no, this is your only option, tell them you're, you're not on the team anymore. I'm going a different direction. Had I not kind of moved heaven and earth to advocate for myself, I'd have been 27. I would have turned 28 probably by the time of the surgery, 28 mm -hmm. with no children and no uterus. Yeah. It's, and it's, um, it's unreal. Kind of and it, it, it really, um, it's really, well, first of all, I want to say that um, menstrual pain, I came to learn that menstrual pain is the only type of pain defined as normal in all of mm -hmm. medicine. Okay. That mm -hmm. tells you a lot right there. Um, I was in a meeting in February of this year with several physicians. One of the physicians is, teaches, he teaches all over the world. Um, with a, an enormous medical center. And I noticed that the men in the room were defining, the male physicians, two of them, I will say, not all, just two, were talking about menstrual pain as if it were localized, like right around the uterus, and that was it. And that struck me as odd. So I, so I asked the question, and then I described my menstrual pain, like vomiting, pain up and down the legs, in the back, uterus, frequent urination, pulsating, going hot to cold. Mm -hmm. And this one man who looked at me, he told me he was headed to India to teach again. And um, he said, I never knew that. And he's taught for at least two decades. Um, and, and it just, um, I was flabbergasted um, because I thought at least the people who were in the room with me would know for sure. Right? Yeah, would know. Um, and it uh, it just remi reminds me of how much work we have to do. And when I hear stories like yours and, and how I had to fight to keep my uterus at 26, that we have so much work to do, but I believe we can do it. I am not getting tired. Um, I am so glad that you advocated for yourself and, and, you know, that's one thing that, you know, keeps me going is that women can reach out to us and get a referral mm -hmm. and know who's going to take care of them mm -hmm. and not have to grapple with those really hard decisions. And it's intrusive in the body because, you know, some women may opt for hysterectomy at some yeah. time in their life, but Research has shown that over 80% of hysterectomies aren't necessary. And there are other issues like prolapse that can happen after you have a hysterectomy. So it's really, um, I'm, I'm so thankful to you for sharing that. I'm glad that you had such a great outcome. And, um, you know, like I said, we can reflect back at a later time to kind of unpack the women in pain because we got lots of comments on that one. It's yeah. resonating with a lot. That's of another, that's a whole other lot. Yeah, that's a whole nother. Yeah, exactly. Um, so um, I know we're nearing our time. I do want to ask you uh, what other projects initiatives are you working on that we can look forward <laughs> to? Can you, is there any that you can share? I don't want to completely put you on the spot because I know there's some things you probably may not be able to talk about, but yeah. is there anything that you can share? 
Yeah, there are, there are a couple that are, are at go time. So we can talk about those. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, new stuff's coming to the Take Up Space movement. Um, merch store like this week that's really timely. And I think um, folks are, are, are going to enjoy and appreciate and it'll resonate with them kind of in this moment that we're living in. So you can go to takeupspace.us for all that. Or I saw someone posted the link um, through my website, either one will take you to the same place. Okay. Um, I am also, I, I've just recently joined the board of directors for a nonpartisan nonprofit organization called Secure the Ballot uh, that is focused on engaging Gen Z and millennial uh, minority voters, so black and brown or black and brown would be voters, uh, so college students, and then also black and brown folks in uh, rural communities that are grossly underrepresented just in, in voter registrations uh, across the country country but particularly in the southeast u.s much needed thank you yeah. for doing that yeah so i re i recommend folks check out secure the ballot.org and find out how they can get involved in their community we are building partnerships right now with uh, local universities and other organizations that are serving these rural communities to build mm -hmm. uh, chapters that serve those communities get folks registered uh, provide them with insights and information on the elections happening in their town because of course we all should know uh, that elections are about so much more than just President of the United States. We have so many down ballot races that have substantial, Absolutely. if not greater, impact on the day to day lives of folks in communities all across the country. Um, we've got to be paying attention to those as well. So it's important we get folks register to vote, uh, informed about the elections in their communities and showing up to the polls or voting by mail this November and every election thereafter. Absolutely. Yeah, I, and, I agree. Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, last project that's currently live that I can talk about. Um, I'm also on the Creative Council Advisory Board of an organization uh, called Climate Power 2020. And we're going to elevate the discourse around climate action and environmental justice. Uh, and I think it's incredibly important, especially for this group, uh, because I'm mindful of the impact of environmental inequity on the health of Black communities, right, that are disproportionately affected by uh, or disproportionately impacted by the effects of, you know, pollution and corporate interests run them up that mm -hmm. effectively poison our communities uh, and have for generations. It's really important that we're having this conversation, uh, not just in kind of this philosophical, uh, oh, the ozone layer is getting thin mm -hmm. thing that we've been talking about for decades, but really understanding uh, the on the ground impact, the real life impact of environmental injustice as we see uh, manifested in the health of black communities. So folks can get involved with Climate uh, Power 2020 as well by texting the word climate to 97779. That's pretty impressive that you remember that. Well, right. I, uh, interestingly enough, this morning, I just read an article about my hometown, Baltimore, mm -hmm. and um, about um, some of the lower income neighborhoods that don't have much greenery and trees mm -hmm. and how the heat index is much higher. And I should have thought of this, but it hadn't occurred to me the heat index is much higher and um and it impacts health absolutely you know, and well-being and um it's telling me i only have a few minutes left like under two minutes but um i i think yeah. that's profound and i just wanted to piggyback your comment by it, the um, mentioning that because i will be looking at all of your initiatives and mm -hmm. um you're working on some fantastic things you brought uh, issues to my mind earlier when we've spoken on the phone about, um, you know, just our um, responsibilities as mm -hmm. um, conscientious Americans to do our duty to um, exercise our right to vote and to um, be thoughtful about, you know, all of the offices. And um, I, I applaud you and I will be continuing to follow you for um, that awesome work. And um, since they're telling me one minute, I'm gonna say, Ryan, we adore you. Um, I am just, I just, I learn a lot from you. I appreciate oh. you and I appreciate all that you're doing and um, keep doing what you're doing. Um, our ambassadors are on from different cities. I've seen West Palm oh, Beach, I've seen Baltimore, I've seen um, New York. I've seen who else was on. I don't want to miss anyone, but um, we are so grateful for you and uh, you uh, blessings, blessings. 
continue to stay safe and uh, I will definitely be in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on. Thanks everyone for joining us. It was an awesome conversation. Hope to come back one day soon. Absolutely. Thank right. you. Have a good night. Okay. Good take night, care. Bye-bye.